Oh, good day, everybody. Welcome to Dr. Hugh Ross's Paradox's Sunday School class. It's Sunday, October 2nd, 2022. Uh, we're at uh, Christ Church Sierra Madre, uh, Southern California. We're broadcasting from there. And uh, Dr. Ross is here today, and he'll be speaking on relating to the Trinity. Uh, he will be away next week. And we'll probably be showing an RTB series called Star Cells and God, dealing with Neanderthal brain and, first ex and the first exoplanets. So we don't have a, a special uh, presenter lined up for next week, but we're working on that. Down the road, we'll get presenters. So, uh, for those of you who want to put questions in online, Go to paradoxes.org and click on the uh, bold line. Or you can go directly to YouTube, uh, Paradoxes Bro, B R O. And when you do that, subscribe and click on the bell, please. Uh, Dr. Ross, please come on up. Okay, thank you. And yeah, next week I'll be in Washington, D.C., speaking at a number of universities and the churches there. Uh, but today, I want to welcome all of you that are here in person. Also welcome all that are participating through YouTube Live. And yes, uh, when we get to the Q&A time, we'll be alternating between people who are here in the class and people who are participating uh, through our uh, YouTube channel here. And. Uh, you know, they announced, made an announcement about the class this morning at uh, Christ Church Sierra Madre, along with an announcement about there's a class uh, for people that are brand new to the Christian faith, and also for people who have been in the faith for a long time. And uh, this is actually a talk that I developed some 47 years ago. And uh, what was happening back then, I was new on the staff at Christ Church Sierra Madre, and I was taking people in the church uh, where we would go door to door uh, sharing the Christian faith with people. And we saw a number of people come to faith in Christ. Uh, we organized them into Bible studies. And after a few years of doing that, we had over a half dozen Bible studies. Some of them as many as 60 people involved. And we pulled them all together. We wound up planting a church. In fact, a member of this class wound up being uh, one of the pastors of uh, that newly planted church. But Taking back uh, some uh, 45 to 47 years ago, whenever we would bring a lot of adults to faith in Jesus Christ, uh, I would give them about a 20 minute message. And what I've done for the first time is to take that 20 minute message and basically put it into a keynote. So this is the first time I've ever given this message uh, in this uh, style. And so I'd appreciate any feedback that you have because I've been asked to prepare this uh, for other churches. Uh, but what we would do in bringing people to faith in Christ, we noticed they had a lot of questions. Who's this God that I've given my life to? Uh, what is this Trinity that the Christians always talk about? And so uh, uh, this basically is talking about, okay, how do you explain the Trinity uh, to brand new Christians? How do you explain how they can develop a relationship? Because what we would share with them is that Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. Well, tell me, how can I enter into this uh, relationship? And this little diagram I got here is something I pulled off the web, which is basically going into the doctrine of the Trinity that you see in the different creeds of the church. I'm going to take this in a different direction. This is not going to be a doctrinal message, but basically a message of how we can practically relate to the Trinity and have an intimate relationship with God. And the best passages uh, for this, in my opinion, are the Gospel of John and uh, John's letter, 1 John. And actually his second and third letters apply as well. And what we see in the opening sentences of the Gospel of John, it says, the light of God, let me pull this back, uh, Here we go. The light of God, okay, I know what will happen. I'm glad I'm giving this for the first time because uh, I now know what I need to do. Give me a chance to fix this. Ah, 
that's the problem. Okay, let's fix that one. Okay, let's start over again. One thing I love about Paradox is I get to treat all of you as guinea pigs to test out my new messages, so... Uh, but I should have uh, noticed that I had the wrong transition in there. But yeah, beginning with the first few sentences of the Gospel of John, it says, the light shines in the darkness. And there it's not referring to electromagnetic radiation, it's referring to the light of God. The light of God shines in the darkness. That's uh, John 1, verse 5. John 1, verse 9. It says, the true light. Uh, and let me make sure that that got fixed. My apologies again. Ah, yes. Okay. Speaks about the true light that gives light to everyone. And what we see in the opening sentences of the Gospel of John is that God's light has gone out into the hearts of every human being. Everybody has received light from God. Every man, every woman, every child. And in my opinion, that includes every fetus. It includes every person who's got a severe uh, mental handicaps. Uh, God's light has gone out to everyone because the receptor of that light is not so much our brain, it's our spirit. As it says in John 3.19, light has come into the world. God's light has come into the world. And uh, so everyone has received uh, that light. And what we see in John, that's 3.19, uh, John 3.21, whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. And this is something you see in the first three chapters of the Gospel of John. God's light has come into the heart of every human being. And if we receive that light, God promises to give us more light. If we reject that light, we're going to have increasing difficulty in receiving any additional light from God. So God says it's basically up to you. I've sent my light out into the world. If you receive that light, I guarantee you'll receive more light. But if you reject that light, you're going to experience greater difficulty receiving any additional uh, light from me. But also makes the point that if you're gonna live by the truth, if the truth matters to you, then that's gonna make it easier for you to receive light from God. But if truth doesn't matter for you, if you live a life of lies, then it's gonna be more difficult to receive a uh, light from God. But what you notice is in the Gospel of John, John never explicitly defines what God's light is. Now you can kind of figure it out, okay, it's God's spirit communicating to our spirit. But what you see in the first epistle of John, uh, first John, towards the end of your Bible, uh, John explicitly defines what God's light is. So this is a question I get from a lot of brand new Christians. They say, yes, I've read the gospel of John. It says that we've all received light from God, but what is this light of God? Well, if you look at 1 John chapter 1, it begins with a statement, God is light. If you want to know what that light is, it is God. God is the light. But that light has three components. And you see this in 1 John 2, 1 John 3, 1 John 4. So 1 John 1, God is light. And then he explains in 1 John 2, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, he bestows life upon people. So he gave his life so we could receive life. God the Son bestows life upon humanity. And in 1 John 3, we learn that God the Father bestows love upon human beings. And God the Spirit, 1 John 4, bestows truth. So we have these three persons of the triune God. And all together, they make up light. Uh, but the Son takes on the responsibility of bestowing life upon humanity. The Father takes on the responsibility of bestowing love. And the Holy Spirit takes on the responsibility of bestowing truth. And so the Holy Spirit, for example, inspires the different Bible authors to communicate truth to us. 
And so that's one source of truth. We can read the pages of scripture and we'll receive uh, truth. Uh, we can live our life to Jesus Christ and receive light from him. And then we can develop a relationship where we get to experience uh, the love of God uh, from God the Father. As we see in the different gospels, when Jesus died on the cross, what happened? We just celebrated communion in the uh, service that we just experienced. The moment that Christ died on the cross, that huge curtain that blocked access to the uh, Holy of Holies in the temple was torn in two. This was a piece of velvet cloth, 20 feet by 20 feet, and it was four inches thick. And what does the text tell us? The moment that Christ died on the cross, that uh, velvet thick uh, blanket was torn in two from top to bottom, basically making a point there was no longer any block or barrier to having a relationship with God the Father. God the Father was in the Holy of Holies, but it was our sin that blocked us from having a relationship with him, from experiencing love from him. But when Christ died on the cross, that uh, barrier was broken, it was torn, and now we have direct access uh, to God the Father. So when we celebrate uh, communion and we eat the bread, uh, that basically is symbolic of what happened with that curtain. We no longer are, are, have a barrier between us and God the Father through the sacrifice of God the Son. We can come into the presence of God the Father and receive love from Him. But we also take the, uh, the wine and that celebrates the fact that there's power in the blood of Christ and we can receive power from God. And this is important. New Christians also want to understand Okay, I can come into this relationship with God. He promises to give me truth, to give me love, uh, but he also promises to give power. But this is the basic definition that we see in the first epistle of John. God's light, 1 John 1, equals God's life plus God's love plus God's truth. God's light equals God's life, God's love, and God's truth. Now, about this doctrine of the Trinity, science only makes sense that God is triune. And so I found this really important to communicate to people brand new in the Christian faith, because a lot of them come from religions where there's only one God, or Judaism, uh, where God is looked upon as being a single person, or Islam, uh, or they come from Eastern religions where there's many gods. and. The point here, and I've got a whole article on this at reasons.org. So if you go to reasons.org and do a search on science and trinity, it'll pop up an article I wrote back in 2016. Basically making the point that the problem with the strictly monotheistic religions, where God is a single person, is they've got no answer for the origin of love. In fact, Ken Samples and I were involved in a debate with two Jew Jewish theologians. And I remember Ken at one point said, well, uh, what is your explanation for the origin of love? And these two Jewish theologians were completely silent. We waited for them to come up with an answer. They never could come up with an answer. And our whole point is, love by definition requires a relationship between at least two independent persons in the sense that uh, we experience love, we receive love from a person, we can express love to a person. So love is impossible unless there's more than one person. And then Ken made the interesting point as well, you know, God could have structured himself as two persons, but we all know from psychology where you've got two persons, you get codependency. With three persons, that codependency is broken. And so we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three distinct persons. But the doctrine of the Trinity is basically three persons and one essence. And you can read whole books on the single essence of God, but the bottom line is that when you see the Son, you see a set of character attributes. You'll see the identical character attributes in God the Father. You'll see the identical character attributes in God the Holy Spirit. They have a single essence. That's not true of us here. Each one of us has different personal attributes. But God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they have the identical character attributes. There's no distinction 
between the character attributes of the Father, the character attributes of the Son, the character attributes uh, of the uh, Trinity. Moreover, they are, have a single mind and a single purpose. And so the purpose and goals that are manifested by God the Father are identical to the goals and purposes manifested by God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. So that's kind of in a nutshell what one essence means. There's more to it than that. But this is the triune God. Three persons uh, manifested as a single essence, a single purpose, a single mind, a single set of character attributes. And so when you relate to the Father, you're getting the identical relationship you would if you're related to the Son or if you're related to the Holy Spirit. And so the relationship we have with all three members of the triune God are identical to one another. Now, that explains why the strict monotheism of, Hindu, of uh, Islam and Judaism is a problem. Uh, because, in fact, what's ironic is when I've been debating Muslims, they'll come up with a mantra, nothing is greater than God. But if God is all by himself, he experiences no love, he expresses no love. And yet he creates creatures that are able to do both, which in one sense uh, makes his creatures, we human beings, and the angels he creates greater than themselves. Because the fact that there are multiple persons means they get to experience love and express love, something that God, if he's a single person, would not be able to do. So it's exactly counter to the mantra of uh, Islam where they say nothing is greater than God and that we humans uh, can't match that. And so that's a huge problem uh, with the Islamic faith. They have no answer for the origin of love other than to make God less than what God uh, is. And how can the greater come from the lesser? How can love come from a being that has no uh, capacity to express or experience love? And you've got the same problem with Judaism. But in this class several months ago, we did a fairly long series on the doctrine of the Trinity. As I mentioned, this is not a talk about the doctrine of the Trinity. If you want that, you can dig up the old paradoxes uh, where we talked about the book of Isaiah and the Trinity. And I, in that class, we we're basically making a point. Uh, in Judaism, they have this misconception that the doctrine of the Trinity is taught only in the New Testament. It's actually taught more explicitly and a greater extent in the Old Testament than it is the New Testament. You actually see it in the opening page of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, where God introduces himself as Elohim. What does a Hebrew word mean? The uni-plural one, the one that is singular and plural at the same time. And this Elohim, when he creates human beings, he purposely uses two pronouns to describe himself. And where it's he created them and we created them. Basically talking that in one sense, God creating human beings came from the one and only God at the same time came from a God that's expressed as three independent persons. So it's there in the opening page of the Tanakh, but it's there in great detail in the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah says more about the doctrine of the Trinity than the rest of the Bible combined. So I mentioned how you can look at the archives at uh, paradoxes.org, but there's also an article I've written that you see archived at reasons.org under my uh, Today's New Reason to Believe, where I actually give you all the passages in the book of Isaiah that teaches the doctrine of the Trinity. And let me just add this. Uh, we have someone from our scholar community coming from South Africa. He's going to be with us in the month of December. I'm trying to get him to come and address this class. He's the chairman of the Mathematics and Astronomy Department at Bitswaterstrand University, David Block. Uh, I've known him since uh, 1983. And uh, David was raised an Orthodox Jew, but he became a Christian. So I asked David, well, how did you become a Christian? He said, I became a Christian through reading all the Old Testament texts my rabbis told me not to read. And a lot of those texts were in the book of Isaiah. And so when he read the book of Isaiah, the Trinity jumped off the page. And he realized, wow, there's something missing in the Jewish faith that I was taught. So, but, you know, in terms of uh, science only making sense, 
if God is made up of multiple pers persons. We also have a problem with Buddhism and Hinduism and these polytheistic religions. Because in these polytheistic religions, we're taught that there are many gods. And these are gods that are independent persons of one another, independent in a sense, not just relationally, but how these different gods have different character attributes. Uh, they got different purposes. They got different plans in terms of the relationship with human beings. And if you actually read the Hindu Vedas, what they're really predicting is when we look at the record of nature, we're gonna see in the record of nature uh, the implications of the universe being created by multiple gods and the creatures within being created by multiple gods. So there's the anticipation in Hinduism and we look at the record of nature, we're gonna find lots of things that appear to contradict one another, things that don't fit. We're gonna see a lack of harmony we're going to see a lack of consistency. That's what you'd expect if you've got millions of gods involved uh, in creation, where these millions of gods have different purposes, different plans, and different intended uh, outcomes from what they create. And Buddhism borrows a lot from Hinduism. Buddhist cosmology is basically borrowed uh, from Hindu uh, cosmology. And you also have within Hinduism this idea that there's gonna be repeated creation attempts. And so the core of the Hinduism is reincarnation, but it's fundamentally based on the concept that the universe reincarnates. All these gods are involved, and so we have the universe uh, coming into existence. It exists for a period of time, and what's really interesting, the Hindu Vedas actually explicitly tell us how long each cycle of the universe will be. 4.32 billion years. Now, when I was a graduate student at the University of Toronto, uh, several of my roommates uh, were into Hinduism. And their comment was, well, uh, it may be a single beginning like we got in Big Bang cosmology, but at that time, uh, back in the 1970s, there was a competing model to the Big Bang, the oscillating universe model, where the universe has not just one beginning, but multiple beginnings, where the universe expands from the beginning, contracts, expands, contracts, expands, and contracts. And I remember my Hindu roommate saying, you know, Hinduism has got to be right because they get the time scale accurate within a factor of 10. We know the universe is about 14 billion years old. The Hindus said 4.32 billion. They got the right number to within a factor of 10. Uh, this indeed uh, must be the way it is. And back in the 1970s, we didn't have the science to distinguish between a single beginning and multiple beginnings. But even back in the 1970s, I remember sharing uh, with my Hindu roommates, well, we do know that the universe has a very high entropy measure. And in Hinduism, you need some mechanism to cause the universe to transition uh, from contracting to expanding. And that transition would require an entropy level at least 100 million times lower than what we measure. So even back in the 1970s, we had measurements. And by the way, uh, one of the first sermons I gave in this church back then uh, was based on a paper that was published in Nature making that very point that the entropy measure of the universe was orders and orders of magnitude uh, too great to permit an oscillating universe model it must be a single beginning, like we see uh, described uh, in the Bible. But when we look at the record of nature, we not only see that there's a single beginning, uh, but we see that science is consistent. It is harmonious. We see no evidence uh, for contradictory uh, revelations coming through the book of nature. We see harmony and consistency everywhere. The Bible tells us, for example, the laws of physics that God established never change. We can trust them. And because we can trust them, we can actually do scientific measurements and realize those measurements are gonna to reveal to us truth and nothing but truth. And it's no accident that the scientific revolution exploded out of Reformation Europe. As some people began to read the Bible for themselves, uh, discovered this triune God, and realized God is a single essence, 
a single set of attributes and, and a single uh, plan, a single purpose for the universe and uh, for humanity. And therefore, we would anticipate from a biblical perspective based on the doctrine of the Trinity, and we do science, we're going to see harmony and consistency across all the scientific disciplines. We're going to see harmony and consistency. We look at the universe as a whole. We look at the earth. We look at the interior of the earth. We look at our galaxy. Everything we see in planetary science is going to be consistent with what we see in cosmology. It's going to be consistent with particle physics. It's going to be consistent with biology and zoology. That's basically the theme of my latest book, Design to the Core, that no matter what size scale we look at in the record of nature, we see the same consistent, harmonious revelation uh, from the Creator, who is one essence. And so polytheism is not consistent with science. Uh, God being strictly monotheistic is not consistent. The only way we can make sense of the science, the record of nature that we observe, uh, is if indeed uh, God is three persons at one essence. But when I'm engaging uh, new Christians, it's like, okay, I appreciate how science only makes sense if God is triune, but how can I get into a deeper relationship with this God, this one essence and three persons? In other words, how can we get more of God's light? How can we have a much more intimate relationship with God? Well, it's interesting about the first epistle of John. Chapter 1, God is light. Chapter 2, it says that the Son uh, gives us life. Chapter 3, the Father bestows love. Chapter 4, the Spirit bestows truth. And chapter 5 is about prayer. Now, what's interesting about prayer, and this is something that I think is crucial to share with people that uh, come into that relationship with Jesus Christ, is to recognize, now that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, prayer is the most powerful tool God has given to his people. You know, new Christians really struggle with this. I pray, I can't see God, I can't tell if God is hearing me, but we need to assure them. Prayer is a communication between your spirit and the spirit of God. Because it's spirit to spirit, we shouldn't expect to see anything. We shouldn't expect to hear anything, but communication is going on. But the promise we get in uh, John and 1 John is that prayer is the most powerful tool God has given to his people. And because it's so powerful, we actually see in 1 John uh, that he gives us detailed instructions on its use and even tells us ways that it should not be used. I mean, of all the tools God has given us, prayer is the only tool where God says, don't do it in this way. Because of how powerful prayer is, God has put restrictions on its use, but he's also given us insight on how we're to pray. And at this point, I'm going to turn this into a regular Sunday school class. And what I'm going to do is ask all of you that are here in person, and hey, those of you that are participating virtually, if you want to put something in the comments section, please do. But here's what I want all of you to share. Based on your knowledge of Scripture, I know some of you have been Christians for decades. Based on your relationship with God, what does the Bible tell us about how we're to pray and what restrictions we're to put on our prayer, how we're not to pray? So, anyone, what does the Bible tell us about prayer? What instructions does he give us about praying? Yes. Yeah, yeah, you, know, you had your hand up first. Go for it. Yeah, let, let's give them the microphone so people can hear. That'd be great. Test, We're hearing test. from Doug here. Okay, well, my gift certainly is in teaching but, or uh, that, but um, we have the model prayer. And the first thing that comes to mind is uh, like we're supposed to pray to the Father. I, I hear my wife praying to Jesus. I've heard people praying to the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, we're talking about the Trinity today. Of course, it's one God and three persons. But the model prayer does say pray in this manner. They call it the Lord's Prayer, but, you know, that's not his prayer. It's a model prayer. 
he would not say, forgive us our trespasses, you know. <laughs> okay, you're making up a good point, Doug, is that, uh, you know, okay, we're praying to God. Who do we pray to? The Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? Well, 1 Timothy 2.5 tells us that God the Son is the intercessor between we humans and God the Father. As it tells us in 1 John, God is love. And it's through prayer that we can begin to experience love from God. Therefore, it's appropriate that we pray to God the Father. But it's also appropriate we realize God the Son is the intercessor. Because of what he's done for us on the cross, uh, he's opened up the gateway between humanity and the Father. And as I mentioned, the triune uh, God is a God where every single person of the triune God has the same set of character attributes, the same purpose, the same plan. And on that basis, theologians have basically made the point, hey, when you pray uh, to God the Son, you're praying to God the Father, you're praying to God the Holy Spirit. So in that sense, it's appropriate that we in our prayers address God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It really doesn't matter who we talk to, we're getting through uh, to this one God, the single sense of purposes and essence. But that's important. But Realizing, not Mary, right? huh? Not Mary, though, right? Not Mary, no. Uh, that's the important point about uh, 1 Timothy 2 5. It says there's only one intercessor between God and man, and that's God the Son. So no human being can intercede in our behalf. A saint can't help us. Uh, we pray to God. We pray to God alone. So that's important. How do we pray? We pray to God. Yes. Now, we want to give me the microphone. Hang on. Kind of a follow-up question on what he said or, and what you said. Um, if Jesus is our intercessor, it also says the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. And... Um, we know that God says if we pray according to his will that we have what we ask. And so we know that Jesus is praying according to the Father's will. The Holy Spirit is praying according to the Father's will on our behalf. So what should we think about that? Okay, you're getting up to an important point here. Because what did Jesus say before he introduced the Lord's Prayer? He said, do not engage in repetitious, vague prayers like the self-righteous religious leaders do. And this is what you see, for example, in Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam. They engage in these repetitious prayers over and over again. And what Jesus is basically saying, if you pray according to the will of God the Father, it will be granted unto you. Which means that God's intent is that when we pray, uh, we pray specifically. And so, as I tell new Christians, okay, I know you want your relatives to come to faith in Christ. So it's appropriate you begin your prayers with, hey, I want my father to come to faith in Christ. Please, God, bring him into a relationship with Jesus Christ. But the question you're going to hear from God when you pray like that is, yes, that is my will. How do you want me to do it? And so he wants you to get specific about the means. I mean, this impacted me personally. I was the first one in my family to become a Christian. I very much wanted my mother and father to become Christians. You know how long I had to wait for the two of them to become Christians? About 30 years. They both became Christians towards the end of their life. But during those 30 years, God was basically relating to me, saying, please, in your prayers, tell me step by step how you want your father to come to faith in Christ, how you want your mother to come to faith in Christ. And for example, with my mother, I realized, okay, God's not only interested in her coming to faith in Christ, God wants her nursing friends to come to faith in Christ. And I realized it was important that my mother be the last along that line. And so I began to pray for her nursing friends. And I had some wonderful opportunities, got to lead one of them to faith in Christ. So, uh, mainly because of my mother's ailment. That's another story. It's in the book, Always Be Ready. Uh, but that's an example how, you know, over those years, God was helping me, helping Kathy, helping the Christian friends of my parents 
uh, get more and more specific. And as we got more specific, we realized, okay, God's wanting to do a lot more than what we're asking him. And uh, so uh, we're not to pray repetitiously. Uh, we're not to pray for, say, our son uh, to come to faith in Christ and simply say every day, God, bring my son to faith in Christ. God says, okay, yeah, I want to do that. Tell me exactly how you want to do it. So praying according to the will of God means getting specific and detailed about what God wants. And the more specific and detailed we get, then indeed anything we pray for uh, will be done. Now, how often should we pray? Let me just ask that question. How often should we pray? Constantly, day and night. Yes, uh, we do see that same way. We see that in Paul's writings. We're to be praying all the time. Peter uh, says that as well. Uh, but, you know, if you've got a job where you're working 40 hours a week, uh, you can't be spending all of your 40 hours of praying. So what does it mean when we're to be in continual prayer? And again, how are we to pray? How often are we to pray? These are questions new Christians ask. Let me put it this way. Uh, you know, Jesus said, do not be public with your prayers. Uh, don't be ostentatious like the self-righteous religious leaders are. Pray in secret. So I think that's one point. We are to be involved in prayers uh, where no one knows we're praying. It's just me and God. And it says, you know, go into your closet, uh, go into your backyard, uh, whatever. Uh, go someplace where it's just you and God and no one sees. But does that mean we should never pray corporately or publicly? Is it either or? What do you think? You know, we, with COVID, we haven't done this in a while. So I'm having a hard time getting responses here uh, from all of you. Here's a response right over here. Okay, over here. here. Thank you. Here you go. Tell them your name. My name's Phil. Phil Cannon. Phil. It's good to see you back. Uh, I don't think I've seen you since um, maybe 2019 or early two, right. 2020. I'm glad you're back. Um, my personal belief, based on what you're saying and what I've learned in the past, is uh, I want to pray what I believe in and the Nicene Creed is real good for doing that. Mm -hmm. And I want to pray what I'm sorry for in a prayer called Confidior Deo, I confess to Almighty God, is mm -hmm. real good for that. So I like to say those prayers at least daily. Uh, I also like to pray privately, like you're talking about randomly when I see something that I believe might benefit from God's will changing how they are. I'm talking about a little silent prayer when I see the guy under the bridge that doesn't have a home. A little silent prayer that says, God, make a, make a place for him. Give, give him the best you've got. That, that, not a big complicated thing, but I, I do that, especially when I'm driving my car around. I, I do it all the time. Um, sometimes I want to curse at the people in traffic, but I try to back that up with thinking, well, God, help them to use better judgment or help me to use more patience and tolerance. One of the two. Uh, and. One other thing, and then I'll shut up. I've had a prayer list for maybe eight years of all the people that I've had relationships with during my life that have gotten sick or in an accident or harmed in some way. And uh, right now at the bottom of that, and it's a long list, it's now four pages, and a lot of these people are dead. And, and many of them are still alive. Uh, at the bottom of the list right now are the people that I know that are either in hospice or will be in hospice soon and will be with God. And my prayer for them is help them to be in a better place 
and be thinking of them peacefully as you take them out. Right. That's it. Thanks. Okay. Very good. You know, I've often run into new Christians. They look at that passage where it says, pray secretly, just between you and God. Don't pray publicly. But you take them into the book of Acts, take them into the epistles, and you see all these examples of Christians praying corporately. And also, if you read it in the King James translation, it will use the word thou and ye for praying. Ye is plural, thou is singular. So in that sense, we can talk to these new believers and say, it's not either or. You're to pray secretly, where no one knows that you're praying, just you and God. But you're also to pray corporately. And uh, you know, sometimes our corporate prayers are private, sometimes our corporate prayers are public. Again, you see that in the Old and New Testament. There are times when God's people would pray in a very public way, and there are times where they would pray uh, just inside uh, the sanctuary or the place uh, that they were meeting. And so, no repetitious prayers. Do not be vague in your prayers. And notice, also, don't be self-righteous in your prayers. Remember that uh, parable uh, where Jesus talked about the self-righteous religious leader where he was praying, Lord, thank I thank you that I'm not like these other people and their evil behavior. I'm righteous before you. He says, no, don't pray like that. We're all sinners. We're all needing to confess our sins. And we're to engage in prayer and fasting. There are times where we need to sacrifice, whether it be sleep or food or drink uh, or our work. Uh, we sacrifice some things so we can focus more intently on our prayers. And basically, the bottom line is, if you don't think God is answering your prayers, think about fasting. And again, that can be just the two of you, uh, God and you, uh, where you uh, fast to pray in secret, but there's also times where we fast as a group. A good example of that is Daniel, uh, where he would personally uh, sacrifice to pray more intently. And then we go to the book of James, chapter 5. And it talks about the prayer of faith. And the prayer of faith is where you're wanting healing, physical healing, spiritual healing, uh, where there's trauma. I mean, Jesus said in John 16, in this world you'll have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. How do we overcome the world? Through prayer. And so there's tribulations we all face. But the bottom line in James 5 is, if you want to be delivered from the tribulation, whether it's a disaster, uh, you've got some kind of healing, you've got cancer or heart disease, uh, or uh, you've got an unsaved loved one that you want to come to faith in Christ. It says, whatever the circumstance, and it says, if you're waiting for tribulation to come, uh, don't worry, it's going to come fairly soon. In this world, you'll have tribulation. It's guaranteed. As a physicist, I sometimes paraphrase that passage. In this world, you'll have thermodynamics. With thermodynamics, things are going to go wrong. Things are going to decay. Uh, you're going to wind up having to do a lot more work. You're going to experience more pain. That's the way it is in this world. In the world to come, the new creation, there will be no thermodynamics. There will be no decay. There will be no death. There will be no tribulation. But in this world, you'll have tribulation. But in James 5, 13 to 20, it basically says the way you deal with prayers to be delivered from tribulation, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And so James 5, and it basically says, if someone is sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church that they may pray for you and that you may be healed. But when you go for the elders, it says, confess your sins to the elders. And I've been involved in this in this church for several decades. I see that as a command to the elders as well. Hey, when you're praying for someone uh, that is experiencing tribulation and they want to be healed, and by the way, I'm making the point, the healing is not always physical. It can be spiritual healing. It can be anxiety. It could be uh, being delivered from a poverty or trauma as a result of an accident or trauma as a result of a, a natural disaster or trauma as a result of being exposed to evil people, uh, whatever. But it's not just the onus on the one coming to the elders to confess their sins. 
The way I interpret James 5, the elders likewise are to confess their sins. And I remember in this church, uh, many years ago, we would call upon people in church, hey, if you're experiencing some kind of trauma, whether it be physical or spiritual, whatever stress or anxiety, we elders are here to pray for you that you may be healed. But when they come to us for prayer, we would encourage them to confess their sins, and then we would ask them, do you trust us as elders that know you well enough to invite us to engage in prophetic prayer? And what I mean by prophetic prayer is where we call upon the Holy Spirit to expose sins that are not being confessed. And so we would do that. But amazingly, it wouldn't just be the sins being exposed, the secret sins. We all got secret sins. And what's interesting about secret sins is that they're secret, not just to the outside world, they can be even secret to ourselves. We don't realize that that's a sin within our life that we need to deal with. And this is the value of prayer. Prayer is a way of exposing sins that we're unaware of. And so we would invite people saying, can we pray for you prophetically? Where we ask the Holy Spirit to reveal sins in your life that you've not confessed. And incidentally, we want that prayer to apply to ourselves. And so often, uh, the exposed sin that would be revealed would not be the sin in the person coming to us for healing. It would be the sin that was in the heart of one or more of the elders. Because God's interested in healing more than one person. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other uh, so that you may be healed. But as you go to 1 John 5, we note that God says to these new believers, he says, prayer is a powerful tool. It's so powerful that there are certain people you should not pray for. Basically what 1 John 5 is telling us, do not pray for the reprobate. The reprobate is someone who's beyond hope. Uh, in fact, decades ago, we did a study in paradoxes going through the entire Bible and accumulating all the characteristics of what the Bible identifies as a reprobate human being. And we came up with a biblical list of 57 different characteristics of the reprobate. But the bottom line, it is someone who is incapable of uh, recognizing any truth. They can't recognize truth, they can't accept truth, they don't recognize good, they can't do any good, they're incapable of doing anything good, they're incapable of saying anything that is true, they're incapable of repenting, uh, they're incapable of confessing any sin in their life. And uh, this is what God says you're not to pray for. Uh, we're not to engage these people. We're not to pray for them. They're dangerous. As it tells us in Romans 1, verse 32, these are individuals uh, within the human uh, population that are uh, evangelists for evil. And it refers about the fact that their evil is malignant which means if you come into contact with them, you're likely to be infected yourself. And so in 1 John, John says, yes, there are a group of people you should not pray for. Now, having said all that, one reason uh, decades ago, we did a very thorough study on the reprobate. It's easy for us to think that someone is a reprobate just because they've hurt us or they've offended us. Uh, this happened to me frequently uh, when I was involved in marriage counseling, uh, where a husband would come to me and said, well, you know, uh, I have to divorce my wife. She's a reprobate. So I'd go meet her and discover, well, I couldn't find any one of those 57 characteristics being manifested in your wife. She's not the reprobate. You've just wounded one another very deeply, and God wants to heal these wounds. And more frequently, I've seen it the other way around, where the wife identifies her husband as a reprobate and I go visit the husband and discover uh, once again, well, maybe one of the 57, but as I would share with these people, you really can't label anyone as a reprobate until you see all 57 characteristics. If you see all 57, that's pretty much a guarantee that there really are reprobate, yes. Would you also use the word sociopath? Well, many sociopaths are reprobates. Uh, you know, my son is a clinical neuropsychologist. My younger son, he works with these sociopaths. And uh, some of them are exhibiting sociopathic behavior. 
uh, but they can be delivered. Uh, they're not beyond hope. Some sociopaths are beyond hope. Some people we identify as being sociopaths, uh, they've been deeply wounded, they've been deeply hurt. And in my son's case, he says sometimes they have a brain injury where that part of the brain that's necessary to exhibit uh, you know, empathy and uh, humility uh, gets damaged to the point where it can't be expressed. The fact that it can't be expressed doesn't necessarily mean it's not there. It means that the interface in the brain is not able to express that. So again, if my son were here, he would share with you, you've got to be careful. And again, going back decades ago, that's why we did an exhaustive study of what the Bible says about the reprobate, because you can pick up one or two characteristics and think that's all you need. No. They've got all 57? Yeah. And keep in mind, reprobates are rare in the human population for the simple reason it's not to the advantage of the reprobate to allow the reprobate to continue living. The longer they continue living, the longer they continue practicing the reprobation, the greater the judgment they're going to experience when their earthly life is over. And God in his mercy will bring a quick death to these individuals just so they won't have to be tormented to a greater degree in the lake of fire. God wants to minimize that and one way he does that is by bringing an early death. Now, you made the point, someone showing sociopathic behavior, God may look at that and say, they're not beyond hope. Their sociopathism hasn't reached the point of reprobation. I'm gonna extend the life of that individual so they'll have an opportunity to be delivered from it. So sometimes we see God allowing evil people to live way longer than what we would expect them to live because God has not given up on them. But the person who is reprobate, typically God brings a quick end uh, to their life. And for that reason, we don't see a lot of reprobates. Another reason we don't see a lot of reprobates, Jesus told his followers uh, that when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, referring to the day of Pentecost, where for the first time human beings become permanently indwelt with God's Holy Spirit, says so when that happens, you'll become the salt of the earth. And so as a salt of the earth, in the New Testament era, post the day of Pentecost, we can't document a single example of societal reprobation. We see individuals that are reprobate, but not whole cities, not whole towns, not whole nations, not whole tribes. Uh, whereas in the Old Testament era, we see that happening at least a few times. As it says of the city of Sodom, every man, young and old, uh, came to Lot's door uh, to commit homosexual rape against his guests. There was no exceptions. Uh, but today, societal reprobation can't exist because of the salt of the earth. Now, in some doctrines of eschatology, God removes all Christians from planet earth and societal reprobation returns. We see that, see that in Revelation 6 and 7. Okay, I'm gonna take questions, but let me close with this, because I've gone way over, mainly because I need to prepare this a little bit better. But I'll also say this, important for every brand new Christian, you've got a mission. God's given a mission to every Christian. First Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. And my wife and I wound up writing a whole book on this called Always Be Ready, making the point from our own personal experience and the experience of many people here at Christ Church Sierra Madre. And I've actually seen this around the world. If a Christian will prepare sound reasons, good reasons for their faith and hope in Jesus Christ and are committed to share those sound reasons with gentleness and respect to people who are not yet in a relationship with Jesus Christ, they will personally witness God performing miracles to bring people to them that God in advance is prepared to hear and respond uh, to those reasons. And that's where you really get to have an intimate relationship with God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. When you see the three persons of the triune God performing miracles within your life and the life of people that he's bringing to you so that they can come to faith in Jesus Christ. 
And it's just like what you see uh, in the book of Exodus, in the book of Leviticus, and in Numbers, is that when the children of Israel, uh, during the Exodus, had gone years without seeing the miraculous hand of God, their faith wavered. Their relationship became shaken. And what we see, thanks to what God has done on the cross for us, God the Son, is that we can literally be experiencing miracles on a regular basis. And as it says in 2, Peter, or 2 Corinthians 4, <clears throat> when a new Christian, or someone who's been a Christian for decades, is committed to this mission to give good reasons uh, for their hope in Christ with gentleness and respect, be committed to bring people to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, what you'll see are these people being brought to faith in Christ, and it says you'll watch them being transformed on a daily basis. And that's, to me, the great joy of bringing adults to faith in Christ, is seeing how rapidly they are spiritually transformed. 2 Corinthians 4.16, it says, Our bodies are decaying. We're under the influence of the laws of thermodynamics. But it takes a few years uh, as we notice one another's decay. Uh, Desmond, we've been apart for about uh, two or three years. And I'm sure when you met me, you looked at me and says, Wow, Hugh, you've suffered a bit from thermodynamics. Uh, you look a little, more, a little more decayed than you were the last time I saw you. But see, it took about three years for you to notice that decay. And uh, hopefully as we engage one another as followers in Jesus Christ, we say, you know, your body's decayed a tiny amount, but look what's happened to your spirit. Your spirit, as it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, when you're in a relationship with the triune God, it becomes transformed on a daily basis. Literally, I've seen this repeatedly with people I've brought to faith in Christ within a 24-hour period, you can see their spirit has been visibly transformed, literally within a single day. Which means those of us who have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, we can rejoice in the decay of our physical bodies. Some of you here are not as old as I am, uh, but the wonderful thing about getting old as a Christian, every day you live, you become more beautiful, you become more transformed, uh, even though your bodies are decaying away. So we can rejoice in the decay of our bodies because what is happening to us in the spirit realm. And if you don't believe that, go to one of these uh, rest homes. You're mentioning hospice. Go to a hospice facility and spend time with people who've had a relationship with Jesus Christ, an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ for decades. I've done this. I've walked into the rooms of these people uh, who are in hospice you walk into the room, it's like there's a glow in the room. And as I deal with the people who care for these people, they say, we all want to be with this person just because of the radiance of God's love that comes out from that. Not physical, it's all spiritual. I'll take the rest of the time for questions. I think, Steve, you're first, and then we'll go to the virtual audience. Okay, uh, we'll start with one from the audience. If you can okay. come up to the mic and uh, just state your name. Then we'll switch back to uh, someone online. Okay. Well, we got a couple of Steves here, but Steve Rogstad, go for it. Yeah, so Steve Rogstad. So I just had a question about the Genesis 1-3 talks about God says, let there be light. Yes. And do you think that corresponds to the event where Thea struck the earth in the formation of the moon, or is that a different uh, event? Right. Okay, good question. What about John or Genesis 1-3, uh, where God says, let there be light? Well, I think John 1 and 1 John 1 are talking about God's spiritual light. I believe John 1, 3 is talking about electromagnetic radiation. Uh, let there be electromagnetic radiation showing up on the surface of the earth. And in particular, I think it's talking about the visible part of the spectrum. And so Genesis 1, 2, it says that uh, the earth, uh, it was dark on the surface of the waters. The water covered the entire surface of the earth. And the reason why it was dark is not because of the lack of light in the universe, but it's because the waters of the earth were enshrouded by clouds that kept the seas dark. And it says that explicitly in Job 38, 8 and 9, that God had blanketed the early earth with clouds that kept the seas dark. 
So it's not dark because of the lack of light in the universe. It's dark because that light in the universe was not able to penetrate through the clouds and reach the surface of the earth. And so when it says, let there be light, I think it's important to notice the text does not say there that God created the light or made the light. It says, let the light be. When did God create the light? Genesis 1.1, when he created the heavens and the earth. That uh, Hebrew phrase for the heavens and the earth is used 13 times in the Old Testament. And it's always referring to the totality of, physical, uh, of the physical nature. All matter, all energy, all space and time. The energy would include the light. So light pervaded the universe, but it was dark on the surface of the waters. What happened on creation day one, God transformed the atmosphere so the light could now come through. If you want a good analogy, the planet Venus. The planet Venus is an atmosphere 90 times thicker than the Earth, and hence visible light does not penetrate to the surface of Venus except at the very extreme red end of the spectrum. So no orange light gets through, no yellow, no blue, green, uh, None of that gets through. And uh, Earth's atmosphere began three times thicker than Venus's atmosphere today. So with an atmosphere uh, more than 200 times thicker than what we see today, no visible light would penetrate the surface of the Earth at all. It'd be completely dark in the visible part of the spectrum. Ah, but it was a moon forming event, uh, two planets merging together. Our solar system began with five rocky planets, Two of them, Thea and the proto-Earth, merged. They collided with one another, and that event uh, caused the atmosphere to be thinned out uh, by an enormous factor. Our atmosphere is only 0.5% as thick it was before those two planets uh, collided with one another. Okay, we'll take a question from the virtual audience. Okay. Uh, this is from... Uh well, there's no name on it, but it's a, co a comment. Even psychopaths are not beyond hope. Is that right? Certain psychopaths are not beyond hope. Mm. Some psychopaths are beyond hope. Um, yeah. I mean, a good example of that would be Adolf Hitler. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that he did indeed have the attributes of a reprobate. The very fact that he was intent on killing off all the Jews in the world, and then when it was clear he was going to be defeated in the war, he really wanted to kill off all the Germans. And uh, what did God do? He brought a disease upon him. And so Hitler was aware in 1944 uh, that he wasn't going to live long. Uh, he had a very rapidly advancing Parkinson's disease, uh, and consequently, uh, he was dead at age 56. He took his own life. Uh, but he wasn't going to live much longer anyway. So, and that again is an example. Uh, those very few examples where we do see reprobate behavior, uh, God typically intervenes to shorten the life, uh, to prevent uh, the malignancy from spreading. Again, uh, Romans 1.32. Reprobates are evangelists for evil. And so they're not only intent on doing evil, they want to encourage as many people as possible to join in expressing evil to a reprobate degree, and therefore they are dangerous. Uh, we're to avoid them. As it says in 1 John 5, we're not to pray for them. Okay, who's next from the class? I was wondering... Um, yeah, you need to get really close <laughs> to the microphone. I was wondering whether um, we could pray for... A reprobate's demise. I, I can't quite hear you. I was wondering whether we could pray for a reprobate's demise. I had done that a couple of times, and I kind of dialed it back, and I just prayed for an early retirement. Because, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, basically what the basis for that restriction about prayer is, God is telling us these reprobates are dangerous. Yeah. Uh, when you try to help them, they will think that your good deeds are evil deeds, and they're going to reject your offers of help, and uh, they'll turn against you. So, but if you if you don't know them personally, then couldn't you do that at home? Kind of, you know. Well, closet, that's a question I get asked you know. a lot, as they say, they, and usually this happens in politics. 
where they see an individual that's engaging in genocide and they say, is it appropriate to ask God to terminate their life mm -hmm. in order to prevent yes. their reprobate behavior? And how I interpret that, you know, God knows who the reprobates are. He knows who the real reprobates are. We humans struggle trying to identify uh, is someone like Pol Pot possible uh, to be redeemed from their behavior or are they truly reprobate? And basically what I see uh, being expressed in 1 John 5, leave it up to God. He knows what's going on, but uh, for all of us, uh, we're to back away. Let God deal with the reprobate. You know, as it says, vengeance is mine, I will take care of it. Okay. Okay. Uh, we got a uh, online question here from Tiffany or Tinny W. If if we harness zero point energy, would that break the conservation of mass and energy? Okay. A question about zero point energy, and uh, would it break? What was the rest of it, Mark? She wants to know, uh, if we harness zero-point energy, would that break the conservation of mass and energy? Okay, there's a good uh, online article on Wikipedia about zero-point uh, energy. And uh, the bottom line is we're not going to be able to harvest it. And uh, you know, a lot of it has to do, this comes up a lot in athea, debates we have with atheist scientists where they say if you add up all the energy, the universe is zero. So the universe really did come from nothing. Uh, but when they talk about adding up all the energy, the universe, and it being adding up to zero, uh, that doesn't mean that the universe is nothing. A good analogy would be, I've got two bank accounts. One bank account, I've got $300 in it. The other bank account, I got a $300 deficit. If I add up the minus 300 and the plus 300, it comes to zero. Does that mean I don't have any bank accounts? No, the two bank accounts are real. They both exist, but there's a balance. So uh, a zero balance doesn't necessarily mean that we got zero everywhere we look. Uh, it's not the same as having zero money in one account, zero money in another account, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, it adds up to a true zero. And so negative and positive balances can come to zero. So, I mean, you see that uh, if you were to throw a ball up in the air. Uh, when you throw it up, it's got kinetic energy going up, but you've got gravity pulling it down. And when you throw a ball up in the air, there reaches a point where the ball stops going up. Does that mean the ball has no energy? No, it just means that the kinetic energy is perfectly being balanced uh, by the potential energy generated by gravity. They both add up to zero. But guess what? They don't stay at zero. So that's another way of responding to the zero point energy is that does it really stay at zero all the way across? So hopefully those analogies will work. Okay. But there is a good article in Wikipedia. Okay, Steve. Name's your name, sir. Uh, Steve Huffy, I'd like to share my bank account so we can zero it out with your bank account. <laughs> Uh, I won't tell you what, but um, thanks for the uh, view on the Trinity and making it rational. Uh, faith and reason has been a concern to me in the church in that sometimes I think we treat it faith, we don't know how to treat it other than somewhat airy-fairy without a good definition. And um, in looking at prayer, uh, the prayer of a faithful, righteous person such as Elijah makes a big difference and saves a multitude of sins. Uh, in James 5. And my comment, and then get your comment, is that can we think of faith in a very rational way, a testable way, where faith, the Hebrews 11 one, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and treat it as uh, substantively with almost physical words, where we look for substance like a jury would look for substance, not hearsay. Yes. Too often we have presumption. And what can that substance be? Can it be the words of Jesus that we can actually know from the Bible or from the prophets? Something that we can test and say, yes, it worked, or no, it didn't, and then either accept or reject based upon evidence, and it should produce some evidence. Yes. So faith is the substance and of, of things not seen, evidence of things not seen, hope for. Um, 
So juries do this, uh, uh, journalists do this, they don't want hearsay, they want to go directly to the first person. I think Jesus and, and the prophets might be some good first persons that we could uh, pray in faith, and if we're in line with them, we should be able to expect some good evidence. Yes, good point, and you started your question off with a quote uh, from uh, 1 John, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and will bring healing. And so it's in the same context that we see in James 5. Call for the elders. The reason why it says call for the elders, these are typically leaders within the church that people recognize as being uh, secure in the relationship with Jesus Christ, as being righteous in their treatment of one another. That's probably your best chance of finding a righteous person to pray for you. So call for the elders. But we all have difficulties discerning who's the most righteous person in the group. And Jesus told us, it's easy to be deceived. You know, people you think uh, should be at the top maybe aren't there. And so again, that's the benefit of a group of people praying. Who knows who's gonna be righteous? And the righteousness is needed for a prayer may be different than the righteousness for another kind of prayer. So it's like, we don't know which elder uh, is going to be the one who will be righteous in that context. But I love what you were saying, experiment. And so basically I think that's what we're being encouraged to do. Uh, call for these elders and hopefully there'll be someone there who will have the righteousness that's needed for that particular circumstance. But don't be surprised if it's coming from an unexpected source. Also don't be surprised if it's coming from the person asking for healing rather than one of the elders. Maybe they're the one that is righteous in the context of what needs to be expressed at that time. And we're all striving to be righteous, and we all have difficulty really discerning uh, what's righteous and what's not righteous. It's so easy to be self-righteous. And so, again, I like what you're saying, experiment. Uh, that experiment, uh, we become the experiment, if you will and that we can go to the Word of God and, and take actual substance of what's said and put it in the scientific mill and do it and see whether it's true or false. But we dare not pray without substance and then blame God because that would be more presumption and a false experiment of junk in rather than good source. Yeah. Right. And you know, what I experienced when we would do this as elders in this church is people would come to us for physical healing. Almost always there was some spiritual problem that was getting in the way. And so I remember this one lady, she, had, she was basically uh, limping from a serious back pain. And she came to us and said, you know, I want to be healed of my debilitating back pain. I've gone to doctors. And they say, we can't see a physical cause uh, for this very debilitating back pain. But she was literally limping. And so what happened when we gathered together for prayer, and we prayed for about an hour, is some, one of the elders said, tell us about your relationship with your mother. And she immediately started to cry. And it's like, you know, it was clear there was a serious breach in the relationship between this woman and this mother that was generating a huge amount of anxiety in her life, and the back pain was being driven by the anxiety. When that relationship with her mother was healed, uh, the back pain went away, the limping went away. And the whole point is, God is far more interested in a spiritual healing than a physical healing. Something else we learned from those days is, uh, we made the mistake of sharing with the congregation as a whole about these amazing physical, I mean, we have one young woman, 21, who had a very rapidly growing brain tumor, and she came to us for prayer. And uh, within a week, the brain tumor was completely gone. The doctor said it's a clear miracle. We expect that she'd be dead within weeks. The brain tumor was gone. We shared that with the congregation, and she was there to testify. But we realized that caused people to focus on the physical healing, and so, Notice where Jesus would often heal somebody and would tell the person, don't tell anybody. This is just between the two of us. Other times he would tell them, tell everybody. 
what, what you've experienced. And so you need to have that spiritual discernment. When is the time to broadcast the healing that God has performed? And when is it the time to keep it completely secret? It's not an easy thing to discern. You know, just a last comment. Uh, and based upon this supporting one another in prayer, and especially with the spiritual focus, uh, Jesus always built people's faith up for healing if they were mentally capable of understanding about faith. He did not just go say you're healed, but he built their faith up to be healed. And perhaps we can do the same. Sure, yeah. Again, we have a mission. Yes. Oh, time, yes. Okay, I'll wrap things up with a word of prayer. And okay. uh, all those of you who had questions, uh, we always have Q&A for about 45 minutes after the Paradoxes class. So there will be time in the succeeding weeks. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time we've had together with you today. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you're so committed to a relationship with us. You invite us into a relationship with you, and you want it to be an intimate, loving relationship, one where we get to see uh, your power at work within us on a daily basis. So, Father, I pray you would take what you've exposed to us today in your word and help us to apply it in our life and help us to encourage others to apply it, and particularly help those that are new in the faith uh, to immediately begin developing an intimate, growing relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Hey.